Okay. I think, uh, sorry for the delay. Fridays are hard. You expect to rest on a Friday. I do. So I have an, uh, first uh, an announcement about mobile phones. Please turn off your mobile phones. I have under strict instructions from Mariam. Uh, there's no photography and there's no video recording. So we're going to do it ourselves and we'll put it on the website for the record, etc. My name is Bashir Abumani. I teach English at Barnard. Thank you all for coming. Let me begin by also thanking our co-sponsors, the Middle East Institute, the Trans-Arab Research Institute, the Heyman Center, and MISAS, and also thank the student groups who helped us promote and publicize the event on campus, Turath, Students for Justice in Palestine, and the Muslim Student Association. So we are very grateful for their support and help. I'd like to acknowledge the efforts of our program manager, uh, Ms. Mariam Zohni, and thank her for everything she's doing for the center. It's tremendous, practically angelic. Nadia Abul Haj and I decided to organize this conference because we felt we needed a better understanding of the recent Arab popular mobilizations. We were all swept up by the moments of mass action. A long missing component of Arab politics seemed to return with force. Some even felt that their belief in the possibility and the prospect of collective action in the Arab world was vindicated. With the emerging reality of political participation, the field and the scope of our politics has probably changed for a long time to come. Our aim in organizing this conference is to capture the novelty of these political developments by studying three of their essential elements. The first is the causes and the driving forces behind the revolts. The second is the revolts' social and political character and composition. And the third is their ongoing local and regional effects. Here are some of the questions that we hope will become clearer in the course of the day. Do the revolts have common roots? Are there, are, are, are there ideological determinations and their dynamics of development similar? And what explains their divergences and the differing state responses to them? Also, are the agents who triggered and organized the spontaneous demonstrations now benefiting politically from their outcomes? Or have the revolts been co-opted by segments of the existing political elites? This conference then aims to help us understand the Arab revolts as both a region-wide phenomena, as well as more specific individual state events, Egyptian, Tunisian, etc. We couldn't cover all the revolts. I had questions about that as we were organizing. There are some omissions were therefore necessary for us. We would have liked to dedicate time, for example, to the Gulf region, not only to Yemen and to Bahrain, but also to the General Cooperation Council and its Arab-wide efforts at containing and reversing the revolutionary wave. The Saudi Arabian monarchy would require special attention here as it tries to effectively bribe its way out of domestic opposition and continue to bolster region-wide authoritarian rule. Qatar's role would also merit attention, not only because of its media arm, the Jazeera, that it utilizes politically for global influence, but also for utilizing its oil wealth to project a regional standing as a mediator between revolts on one hand imperial presence on the other hand, Islamic fundamentalism, American influence, in effect, Sheikh Qardawi and Hillary Clinton, that kind of relationship. The last omission I'll mention here is Libya, and this is merely for reasons of already existing coverage on the Columbia campus. There have been at least three panels on Libya and on the Libyan uprising in the last two years, so we decided not to replicate it here. Having said that, our speakers are, have written 
some extensively about areas other than the ones that they are speaking about today. So by all means, do raise questions about issues that may not be tackled directly, including our omissions. We did decide to give special attention to two issues that are at the heart of the mission of the Center for Palestine Studies. The first is the role of the US in the region. And the second is, of course, the question of Palestine itself. As much as I'd like to, it's hard for me to think about the Arab world without American domination and American intervention. The US has been so much involved in the region and so intensely of late to the tragic misfortune of millions of Iraqis that we couldn't but dedicate a special place to its particular response to the revolts and to its defense of its own imperial interests in the region. Our first keynote is dedicated to doing exactly that and to answering the question of what the US conception is of the democratic transitions and will they be as possibly unfruitful for the majority of Arabs as the Oslo peace process has been for the majority of Palestinians. Oslo, we should remember, came on the heels of the first Arab revolt in recent years, the Intifada of 1987-88. That too was a mass autonomous and self-organized, popular and non-violent struggle against political subjugation and repression, as well as against, in the Palestinian case specifically, Israeli colonialism and military occupation. There's one change to the program, I thought I'd announce it at the beginning, and it relates to our closing panel. Our closing keynote has unfortunately bolted in the last minute. Terrible thing to do. I apologize for this unforeseen development. Our last session now has a new format. I'll moderate a discussion with uh, Rashid Khaldi and Gilbert Ashkar, both heads of Palestine centers, uh, one, uh, an ex-head here in Colombia, and Gilbert now the current head of the most recent Palestine center at SOAS in London, about the question of Palestine after the revolts. What should the Palestinians expect from a politically changing Arab world, an Arab environment, and would increasing Arab challenge and democracy benefit the Palestinians and the Palestinian cause? What impact does the increasing power of the Islamic movements have on Hamas and on Palestinian political possibility? And what should we make of the recent Palestinian bid for statehood at the UN? These are some of the questions that we'll tackle in the last uh, closing discussion. This is how the day looks. To the more immediate task at hand, the opening keynote on America and the revolts, I'm honored to have Rashid Khalidi address this crucial issue today. Rashid Khalidi served as co-director of the Palestine Center last year, one of the founders, and is Edward Said Chair of Arab Studies at Columbia. He is author of hundreds of articles and numerous books on Palestinian and Arab history, including Sewing Crisis, American Dominance and the Cold War in the Middle East, The Iron Cage, The Story of Palestinian Struggle for Statehood, and Palestinian Identity, The Construction of Modern uh, national consciousness. He's currently finishing a book on the history of uh, American peacemaking in the Arab world, which will be out, I don't know if he registered the sort of an ironic, uh, which will be out next year. He'll speak for 30 minutes, and then we'll open it up for questions. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you all for coming. Good morning, everybody, um, and thank you all for coming. Um, I will only speak for, I hope, about 30 minutes. Um, and I'm going to talk about America and the Arab revolts, but as you see, I will, as you will see, I'm going to take a slight detour before I get to America. Um, it's been a year now, a little over a year, since regimes in the Arab world began to totter. Uh, for those of you with any historical sense, you know that for many decades, the Arab world was a byword for immobility, repression, and the stability of its undemocratic regimes. Until 2011, there had not been real regime change in a single Arab country for over 40 years. Uh, many Arab countries, in fact, had systems that were unmodified for much, much longer than that. Now, Everything is beginning to change. Um, two 
very well entrenched despotic rulers, one in Tunis and another in Cairo, disappeared after only a few weeks of a popular uprising to other despotic rulers in Tripoli, Libya, and in Sana'a, uh, fell thereafter. Another in Damascus is fighting to survive. Meanwhile, all the other Arab regimes from the Atlantic to the Gulf are being forced to make concessions to their people out of fear of their suddenly energized citizenry and out of fear of contagion from those five countries where there have been five or six countries where there have actually been revolutionary developments. So what we've seen is that what was a frozen political situation for many decades, for generations in fact, has melted or begun to melt overnight in the heat of this popular upsurge that began in Tunisia and has now spread to a number of other Arab countries. Something else has developed in the Arab world, however, in this, in this period. In response to these events, a well-financed, absolutist, and anti-democratic counter-revolution, which exploits religion as a, as a banner, has become active everywhere in the Arab world. Its reactionary efforts are reminiscent to anybody with any historical sense of the efforts of the Habsburgs, the Romanovs, and the Bourbons in Europe for decades and decades after the French Revolution. In fact, well into the second half of the 19th century. For generations, these three reactionary, monarchical, religiously based regimes fought revolution, fought progress, fought democracy. And uh, I, I see no parallel better than that to what we're seeing in the Arab world. Now my topic today is America and the Arab revolts. And to understand how I think the United States relates to these revolts, uh, I'm trying to give you first a sense of a little bit of the recent history behind them. I'm not going to give you a history lesson, I promise. Um, and that's what I will begin with. I will then conclude with uh, what I have to say about my main subject, which is the United States and, and, these, and the Arab world. I think one, one thing that one should start with is to sort of clear the slate. And I think it's important to state that what has happened since December of 2010 shows how very false were all of those analyses that were based on the supposed passivity of the Arab peoples in the face of repression and despotism. Um, they weren't passive, and they, they showed it with great courage. These upheavals all began with ordinary people peacefully demanding freedom, dignity, democracy, social justice, accountability of their rulers, transparency, the rule of law, constitutions. Motherhood and apple pie, those were the demands. Arabs at the end of the day, young Arabs in particular, turned out to have hopes and ideals that were indistinguishable from those of the peoples who have brought about democratic transitions in other regions of the world in recent decades. In fact, the, almost the entire world in recent decades, Eastern Europe, Southeast Asia, South Asia, Latin America, one could go on, many parts of Africa. Now, this was a surprise to some people. It was a surprise to anyone who was deluded by the Western media's reductionist view of the Arabs, incapable of this or that, Islam prevents progress, and so on and so forth, or who were deluded by this media's obsessive focus on Islamic fundamentalism and terrorism in dealing with the Middle East. That was in almost the only thing that the media talked about, except when the United States did something in the Middle East. So the Middle East was good for two things. It was good for nasty portrayals of Arabs and Muslims, it was good for showing how not violent and terrorist they were, or it was good for a background to something the United States was doing, either an American military force or an American uh, Secretary of State or President. Now, nothing has been decided in any Arab country which has experienced these upheavals. I saw this firsthand in Cairo three different times last year and in several other Arab capitals that I visited uh, over the past year and a half. The process of thoroughly changing regimes, the process of building democratic systems has barely begun, even in countries where dictators have already fallen. The army is still in place as a center of power in Egypt and Yemen. Um, you may have noticed today that the uh, former chief of Egyptian intelligence managed to collect 30,000 signatures overnight. Uh, he's running his campaign out of the intelligence headquarters. Anybody who says that the regime has changed in Egypt has been blind to what is actually happening in that country. And Egypt is one of the countries where there has been the most change. 
chaos stalks Libya. It's not clear when or if that country will have a stable uh, transition. And Tunisia, where there has been a lot of progress in many respects, uh, there's a process of destabilization going on at the hands of a really tiny minority of radical Salafis who are financed and directed from abroad in a situation where they won almost nothing in the elections. They have managed to make life very, very difficult uh, for the Tunisian transition. Moreover, when and if a democratic system can be established in any of these countries, there is no guarantee that it will not be dominated by entrenched, powerful, moneyed interests, something to which no democracy is immune. I refer you to the United States of America for evidence, if you had any confusion on that point. Uh, most importantly, it will be hard for any new popular Arab democratic regime, once any of these may be established, to achieve in particular the social justice and the rapid economic growth that are going to be necessary in order to provide equal opportunity, quality education, good jobs, decent housing, and desperately needed infrastructure. These are precisely the things that the old regimes failed to provide, especially in those countries that have actually seen revolutionary upheavals. And these are among the main reasons that these revolutions took place. The number of people living in Egypt on under $2 a day grew from 39% of the population to 43% of the population during Mubarak's last decade in power, under $2 a day, 43% of the population. During this period, wages as a share of Egypt's national income decreased from over 30% to under 25%. So 75% of Egypt's national income is not going to the people who do all the work as wages. It's going somewhere else to someone else. And that's a process that is, uh, that there's been a widening of that gap. All of this took place during an era of open markets and infusion of foreign investment, very high profits for private companies, a constantly rising Egyptian stock market, and a vastly wider and growing gulf between the extremely rich, the obscenely rich, and the rest of the society, the entirety of the rest of society. The income gap was growing and growing. Egypt, with its 6% annual growth rate, in its GDP over, over a number of years consistently, was regarded as a model by AID, the IMF, and other institutions of the neoliberal global economic consensus. I would argue that what we've been seeing across the Arab countries that have, that have witnessed these upheavals has thus in part been a revolution against this neoliberal consensus, against the free market, uh, sorry, against the free trade market fundamentalist dogma uh, that underpins this neoliberal uh, model. In most of these countries, this doctrine has attained the status of economic gospel in recent years. Their central bankers, their, their ministers of, of finance and economy, their presidents, their prime ministers, their business elites are completely infatuated with this model. This has meant a rush to privatize the public sector, to shred the social safety net, to lower subsidies. Food subsidies decreased by 50% under Mubarak from the beginning of his term in 81, uh, in 82, until his uh, removal. Uh, a, a rush as well to smash or weaken trade unions where they even existed or where they were legal, and to drive down wages and increase productivity. Uh, the point, of course, is to make people work harder for less money. All of this while profits were being increased for both international companies and local businesses. Overturning this economic regime was one of the objectives of many, many people involved in these upheavals. Um, there's a problem, however. It's going to be extremely difficult for any new regime in any Arab country to fulfill the boundless economic and social aspirations of their peoples while avoiding alienating the West, which most of these governments still feel must be courted to provide investment. The United States and the countries of the rich North might not oppose democracy per se, but they will react strongly to any challenge to the current neoliberal world economic order. Freedom, one of the favorite words of our politicians, I think is a word that has to be parsed because in the American lexicon where applied to other peoples, freedom may or may not mean the people's free choice of their government. If they make a bad choice, then it doesn't. But it definitely means freedom of movement for capital and profits, free trade, and minimal restrictions 
on private enterprise. That's what freedom really means in the American lexicon. Uh, in both Egypt and Tunisia, as is the case in Turkey, the Islamists who uh, uh, form the largest political parties, in the case of Egypt, the Ikhwan Masinmin, the Muslim Brotherhood, which has a political party that won the largest number of seats in parliament. In Tunisia, Hezm uh, al-Nahda, uh, the, the Nahda party. Both of them, like the, the Turkish AKP, are deeply committed to the capitalist system and to the free market. Their ideas of social justice are more rooted in charity and voluntary effort than they are in redistribution of wealth via a vigorous state sector. It's thus not at all surprising to anybody who understands this meaning of freedom, uh, that the American sense of freedom, that the United States government has so far been approving of changes in both countries thus far. Now, if the new regimes, whatever their nature may be, fail to meet popular social and economic aspirations, this failure is undoubtedly going to be exploited by the forces of Arab reaction that I've talked about. These forces, which are led by, obviously, Saudi Arabia and its Gulf allies, are busy buying politicians and political parties. In the parts of Egypt I visited during the second round of the elections, the largest electoral effort that I perceived was Hezb nur a party that didn't exist two months, two and a half months before that election. They had more expensive electoral propaganda than any other party, including the parties that won the most seats, the Waft Party and the Muslim Brotherhood's Party. They had hundreds of millions of dollars to spend on this election. They didn't exist several months ago. Uh, this is not an indigenous uh, 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 phenomenon, and it is, in fact, being investigated currently by Egyptian prosecutors. So they're busy buying up politicians and, and political parties. They're busy doing what they can to limit democratization as much as they can, and they're busy shoring up the old regime where it still exists. So that's one danger. Another danger is that failure by these new regimes at these social and economic tasks could open up the way for extreme violent minority trends that prosper in circumstances of chaos, uh, deprivation, and disorder. Such circumstances were unleashed, were in fact created, by the American invasion and occupation of Iraq and the destruction of the entire Iraqi state system and Iraqi military, Iraqi security forces. Um, we can already see these kinds of uh, destructive minority, violent minority trends at work in Libya, in Yemen, and in other parts of the region. Finally, we must never forget that this is the Middle East. It's not just any old part of the world. It's the Middle East. Because of its strategic position, because of its energy reserves, this is the most coveted region of the world. It is the region of the world which for centuries, at least two centuries, has been the most penetrated by foreign interests. It is a region that is consequently vulnerable, as it has been through much of its history, to external intervention that could divert or distort outcomes, things that might have nothing to do with the Arab Revolution. For example, a war on Iran, whether launched by the United States or by Israel, could uh, play havoc with the new Arab order and change everything. And it's a typical example of ways in which this region is vulnerable, penetrated by foreign uh, forces and vulnerable to external intervention. I've argued elsewhere that these revolutionary upheavals have been unprecedented. This is not because they were often mainly peaceful. This has actually happened before in the Middle East. There have been peaceful upheavals all over the region for more than a century. Nor is it because they are focused on democracy and constitutional change. That has been true of many movements in the Middle East for nearly a century and a half. In fact, some of the most, most of the most important movements in the Middle East were directed at those, at those objectives, uh, even though many of these democratic experiments were systematically undermined by Western powers. These powers did this because their ambitions were being obstructed, or they feared that their ambitions would be obstructed, by democratically elected parliaments, which insisted on national sovereignty and, in, and constitutional uh, uh, sorry, national sovereignty and on control of their own resources, especially control of their own resources. Far from giving support to democratic and constitutional rule in the Middle East, if you look at the historical record over a century and more, the Western powers led by the United States since World War II generally undermined these two objectives, democracy and constitutional rule. They preferred to deal with weak, pliable, unpopular autocrats who would do their bidding perfectly understandable. It's not because of these things that these uprisings were unprecedented. Rather, most of the uprisings from 
the end of the 18th century through the 1960s were primarily directed at ending foreign occupation and foreign control. And they succeeded in achieving this objective. The only exception in the entire Arab world is actually Palestine. Everywhere else, foreign occupation, foreign military rule was ended uh, by a, a whole series of popular uprisings. What distinguishes these revolutions, starting in 2010 and 2011, from their predecessors, is that they mark the end of a phase of national liberation from colonial rule. That is completely over, and they mark uh, the beginning of an entirely new phase. In this new era, uprisings are largely inward directed, focusing on the problems, primarily on the problems of Arab societies and problems of Arab governance. With the Cold War, the old colonialism gave way to a new form of external influence, first the influence of the two superpowers, and then more recently, the influence of the United States alone. Since then, the entire Arab regional system has been upheld by US power which supported many dictatorial regimes. But while these crucial external factors, external intervention, external support of these regimes, have always been in the background of these revolutions, their primary focus has been on the internal problems of democracy, constitutions, inequality, and social change. Now, there was one other demand of young Arabs in the street. This was the demand for dignity. And I've written about this elsewhere. And I've said that this has to be understood in two senses. Firstly, it meant the dignity of the individual. Secondly, it meant the dignity of the collective, of the people, of the nation. I'm not going to talk about the demand for individual dignity. It's perfectly understandable in the face of the authoritarian police states that crushed the individual all over, or in most parts of the Arab world. However, the, the demand for collective dignity raised by these revolutions relates in particular to the dominating role of the United States and of its protege in the region, Israel, which brings me to my main focus and brings me to America and the Arab world. While there's been little mention of the dominant role of the United States in reporting on the revolutions of 2010 to 2012, and although I've argued this was not their main focus, it was always there in the background. So was the fact that these Arab police states, most of them, not all of them, most of them, benefited from top-of-the-line equipment and extensive training in the best facilities the United States and Europe could provide. American tear gas canisters were fired copiously against protesters in Tunis and Cairo and other cities in Tunisia and Egypt, they've been, just as they've been used for years against Palestinians demonstrating peacefully in occupied Palestine. Uh, ben Ali's thugs, Mubarak's thugs, all of their thugs were on excellent terms with the Western intelligence services. Uh, the French Minister of Defense, Michel Alliot-Marie, lost her job last year for too publicly offering the Tunisian regime French expertise in police state control. It was too much even for the French, and she lost her job. Uh, as we all know from uh, courageous attorneys working for outfits like the Center for Constitutional Rights, the United States has outsourced some of its torture to these Arab police states, showing the level of close collaboration. Uh, including Egypt, Jordan, Algeria, Morocco, and, surprise, surprise, Syria. In the past, Western support for stability, so-called, often meant support for repression, corruption, the frustration of popular demands, and the subversion of democracy. It also meant the sub subordination of the Arab countries to the dictates of US policy and to the demands of Israel. The demand for collective dignity is a call to end this unnatural situation. Now, Arabs are just as aware as people around the world of the long-standing gap between the proclaimed ideas of the United States and the other great Western democracies and their cynical realpolitik policies. Because people are so aware, Americans and Europeans, whether American officials or people working in NGOs, probably would do well to refrain from preaching to those in the Arab world who've successfully engineered striking change. The revolutionaries who've done this know far better what they need to do to achieve democracy and social justice than people in the West who until a couple months ago were the closest friends of their overthrown dictators and are still intimately linked to the remaining Arab despots, notably the conservative regimes in the Gulf. How a country which has been an ally of Saudi Arabia since 1933 can preach democracy in the Arab world is a little difficult for me to understand. Uh, democracy is not something which 
uh, is identified with Saudi Arabia since 1933 and until this day. Now, the upheavals of these past 18 months raise a number of questions. I'm going to just raise some of them. I won't, I won't be able to answer most of what I, I touch on. Uh, I've already, I have actually already touched on two of them. One is whether the spirit of liberation that was unleashed by these revolutions can be sustained in the face of the counter-revolution. I really don't know the answer to that. That's a struggle that's going to be worked out at the ballot box, uh, place by place, city by city, country by country. Another question is, that I've already touched on is whether it will be possible to surmount the daunting structural problems of the Arab countries. I do not envy a new government whenever one is established in Cairo. How you deal with the problems of Egypt is not going to be, it's not going to be easy. Even Tunisia, which has less deep social problems, is not going to be an easy country uh, to, to, to rule and to, and to meet the demands of their, of their peoples. A third question is whether the Arabs will actually succeed in putting in place stable, lasting, new political systems, or whether they will end up with a patchwork version of uh, a modified version of what they had before. Uh, watching progress in Egypt is, is almost painful because there's a move in this direction and then a move backwards and then a move in this. It's unbelievable how slow and how hesitant uh, and how uh, limited change so far has been in terms of these kinds of basic constitutional factors. Uh, Tunisia and Egypt, however, have already witnessed competitive elections, and they've witnessed the beginning of constitutional reform, uh, though in Egypt it is up in the air again after a court, a court decision. Uh, in both countries, however, entrenched elements of the old regime remain. This is particularly noticeable, obviously, in Egypt. In both of these countries, in Libya and in Yemen, if either Yemen or Libya ever achieves minimal stability, new regimes are likely to be dominated, initially at least, by popular Islamist political parties. These are the most popular parties in all four of those countries, if, if, if elections ever can take place in, in Yemen and, and, and Libya. But undemocratic forces and myriad problems await these new governments whenever and wherever they can be formed. Another question, and this is a question that anybody who thinks about the rest of the Arab world has in their mind, another new question, another major question, is whether what started in all these countries where regime change has begun is the beginning of a wave which will effect, uh, eventually affect the rest of the Arab world. Now, I, I use the term the Arab world very loosely because for all of their similarities between the various Arab countries and between the various Arab regimes, each Arab country is in fact very, very different from the others. The populations of several of these countries, Syria, for example, Jordan, Algeria, Bahrain, Iraq, are much less demographically homogenous than are Egypt and Tunisia, or even, in some respects, Yemen and Libya. Uh, in all of these countries, there are significant ethnic and religious cleavages that rulers can and do exploit to divide and rule. If you want to see the strategy of the regime in Syria, uh, this is what you look at. These cleavages have been very important to the regime in, in undermining or trying to undermine the popular uprising there. And in some cases, there's memory of bloody civil strife that rent these societies in the past and that may make people hesitant about protesting. That's certainly the case in Algeria. It may be the case in Iraq. Nevertheless, there has been a contagious effect of these protests and of demands for democracy uh, starting, that started in Tunisia and, and, and have swept the region. Watching Arab satellite TV coverage of these revolutions, one is struck by the ubiquity from one end of the Arab world to the other of common aspirations for freedom and dignity of an entire generation of young Arabs. That's not to say anything positive about the coverage. It's simply to say that it is, it is unanimous in showing this. This coverage also confirms the existence of a common pan-Arab public sphere. There's much talk about the end of pan-Arabism, about the rise of Islam, but one of the interesting things is these currents are essentially currents that affect the Arab countries. They have a spillover into a country like Iran, a Muslim but not Arab country, or Turkey, a Muslim but not Arab country, or Somalia, a Muslim but not Arab country, but they're essentially currents that affect the Arab world. And so what this has proven is that there is an Arab public sphere. It's not to say there's a pan-Arab bloc or that there will be one Arab state. There certainly won't be. But uh, it is to say uh, that you have something uh, that within which the same themes resonate. And, and, and Arab satellite TV has shown that clearly. I think that uh, the media has told us that these revolutions owe a great deal to modern media, but I think it's a mistake 
to focus uh, excessively on the specifics of the new technology. These were not revolutions that were made on Facebook or Twitter or whatever. Uh, they were not, they were re revolutions if they were made on any, any piece of technology that was crucial, it was actually cell phones, which are new but not that new. Um, uh, and they were revolutions that were certainly affected by satellite TV. But this is not new. Any historian of the region will tell you, and I just wrote a piece in which I argued this, that a common Arab public sphere existed in the past, relying on early forms of technology, whether we're talking about the good old-fashioned printing press and newspapers, or whether we're talking about radio or movies or earlier iterations of television. What changed was that new technological means were linked to non-hierarchical network type forms of or organization that were adopted in one Arab country after another to elude the surveillance of the secret police. The secret police were looking for pyramidal, hierarchical, structured political movements. They didn't find them. They couldn't stamp this out. What they had instead were non-hierarchical uh, network type forms of organization uh, that uh, were completely invisible to the secret police, which for generations, since the British and the French trained them in these countries, and then the Soviets and the East Germans after them, uh, were looking for the equivalent of a communist party or Ikhwan Muslimin, which are identical in terms of their structure. They didn't find those things. That's new. That's completely new. By the way, those non-hierarchical network type structures are completely useless for an election campaign. You can't run an election campaign without hierarchy, structure, money, a pyramid, an organization, which is why the uh, revolutionaries haven't won a single election. And political parties that existed before the revolution, uh, in most cases, did the, did the best uh, in elections where they took place. However, let me say one last thing about this public sphere. Just as it helped to transmit the sense of possibility that was unleashed by these Arab uprisings, it can also spread a sense of disillusionment and disappointment at the frustrations of the hopes for the Arab Spring. Some regimes are relying on this today as a barrier against unrest. That is, in fact, the basic argument of the Algerian regime. See what's happening in Libya? Is that what you want? Secret police will be around to make sure that you want it, uh, that you don't want it. So the, the, the repressive nature of these regimes is upheld by their utilization of this disappointment. Uh, with things like what's happening in Libya, for example. Now, the last question that these Arab revolutions raise, and this is where I want to end and I want to talk about the United States from now on, is a question of the past and present role of the United States and its European partners in the past in upholding the rotten Arab status quo, which is beginning to crumble, and in the present. What are they going to do and in the future? There's a long and unedifying history, which I won't regale you with, of American support for despots and absolute monarchs across this region, as long as they allowed US military bases on their territory, as long as they allowed unfettered access to their oil resources and invested their revenues in the West, as long as they were subservient to Israel, and as long as they otherwise did what was wanted of them by Washington. Those were the good guys, or the people who were told we were, we were told were good guys. Even more recalcitrant despots have at times been provisionally admitted to American graces. This has been whitewashed in history, but Saddam Hussein was a good guy from the early 1980s until 1991 when he invaded Kuwait. Qaddafi was a good guy for about nine years from the moment he handed over his nuclear weapons until he was overthrown in February of last year. Even Hafez al-Assad and his son Bashar were good guys in American eyes at different points. So if you do what the, what the West wants, uh, you, can, you can even be a more recalcitrant uh, uh, despot uh, than the ones who've been in good graces for generations. This has been the case, although the United States has always been torn in its foreign policy in the Middle East and everywhere else, between its principles, which include upholding democracy, and its interests, which include propping up autocrats who serve supposed American strategic aims. When there is little American public scrutiny, which is usually the case with foreign affairs, the American public doesn't pay much attention to foreign affairs. It is these strategic interests, rather than American ideals, that have in invariably predominated in US policy, whether in the Middle East or elsewhere, in fact. American public opinion about the Middle East in the past was often fickle and was easily influenced by stereotyping of Arabs and Muslims and by the inherent strong biases that exist in favor of Israel in the American public. 
Over much of the past 18 months, however, with the US media featuring stories of charismatic young Arabs bringing down dictators and calling for democracy, some of them doing so in perfectly comprehensible English, many in the US public began to see the Arab world in a mildly positive light. This is one of the first times this has ever happened, by the way. Washington was obliged to respond by tepidly and reluctantly supporting a democratic transition in Tunisia and Egypt and feebly calling for restraint by its other Arab clients and allies in repressing their own peoples. Unsurprisingly, such calls had no effect whatsoever in Bahrain or in the oil-rich eastern province of Saudi Arabia where the repression was ferocious in both cases uh, with Saudi and Gulf forces doing the job in Bahrain and the Saudi National Guard doing the job inside Saudi Arabia. There's ample reason to fear that this phase of verbal American support for democracy may end when the attention of the American public wanders from the Arab world. For example, we have an election, which is going to keep everybody busy. And when and if American vital strategic interests are seen to be at stake. Then, when that happens, when the public stops paying attention and when something important like Israel comes up as being threatened, um, cynical policymakers in Washington will undoubtedly go back to good old-fashioned real politique. In any case, there's plenty of room for mystification and for imposing desired outcomes under the twin cloaks of advancing democracy. You can do almost anything if you say you're advancing democracy, even if the, what you're doing is putting completely non-democratic people in power. Um, or the other cloak is humanitarian intervention. In both of these cases, the media will often play along. Even there, interests and real world constraints always play a part. Libya's oil, its military weakness, the favorable nature of Libya's terrain, and the fact that it's not a country of immense strategic value made military intervention in Libya attractive and easy. The United States supported the British and the French in doing that. The differences to Syria's situation could not be more obvious. Syria probably can defend itself. It has air defenses. Syria has very unfavorable terrain. Syria is a country of immense strategic value. It borders on a number of enormously important countries, Turkey, Iraq, Jordan, Israel, Lebanon, Eastern Mediterranean. Um, and this explains the extreme reluctance of the United States and its Western allies to intervene there. The gap between the United States and the Arab Gulf monarchies, which was non-existent over Libya, the question of intervention in Libya, uh, is quite wide over Syria. The Saudis and the Qataris and other Gulf countries are gung-ho for intervention. The United States and its Western allies are not in the least interested. I would argue that this new moment in the Middle East makes the old business as usual approach much harder for American policymakers. Because of the pivotal importance of Egypt throughout recorded history, in fact, history begins in Egypt, so since history began, Egypt has been important. Uh, because of this, Mubarak's political demise has caused deep concern in all the Middle Eastern status quo states, from the United States and Israel to Saudi Arabia. With Mubarak's disappearance, all of these countries have lost an irreplaceable regional asset in terms of keeping things as they were and cementing their ascendancy. Indeed, the fall of Mubarak has removed what for 40 years has been a central pillar of American strategy and of Israel's domination of the region, really since, since, uh, the, the, 19, since, the, since the 1970s. Um, looking only at the Palestinian arena, the half-hearted moves towards inter-Palestinian reconciliation, which began last year, the partial opening of the Rafah crossing point into Gaza, the Hamas-Israel prisoner exchange when Gilad Sharait was let out and several hundred Palestinians were released, the effort to obtain UN membership for a Palestinian state, Israel's relative recent restraint in dealing with rocket fire from the Gaza Strip, all of these are among the first fruits of the fall of the Mubarak regime. Now, these are not very important phenomena that I've talked about, but they would have been unimaginable but for the fall of the Mubarak regime. They were the result of Mubarak's fall, the disappearance of Omar Sleiman, who was his intelligence chief and the person who dealt with the Palestinian arena and who personally supervised so-called reconciliation talks between the two Palestinian factions, which were designed to prevent reconciliation. His disappearance immediately changed that. That's an example of what I'm talking about. This is also in some, result, in some measure a result of the weakening of the Assad regime in Syria, which pulled the rug out from under Hamas uh, in Damascus. I would argue that in spite of the fall of Mubarak and in spite of all the changes that have taken place in Egypt so far, the core interests of the United States in Egypt are still largely intact. 
These core interests are a close relationship with the Egyptian army, maintenance of the peace treaty with Israel, and Egypt staying wedded to the neoliberal economic model. That's all Washington really cares about. The rest is gravy. They don't care about anything else. Democracy, constitutions, Muslim Brotherhood, whatever. They really don't care. The United States has many means of trying to influence outcomes in Egypt, but these means are limited in an era of growing populism and mass politics. And this is what I would point you to. Don't look at whether this constitution succeeds or who wins a majority. Look at whether public opinion, parliament, the press can actually affect what the politicians do. Whether they're forced to pay attention to what their people want, whatever form of government emerges in these countries. This will be the important thing to look at. I have never seen the level of freedom of speech and free public discourse in Egypt that I found in my trips there last year. I've never seen anything like this. And the rulers are afraid of their people in a way that I've also never seen in Egypt. The, the, some, a, a demonstration takes place, and the, the, the military, the Egyptian military, backs down. Again and again and again and again this has happened. Now, it doesn't happen every time, but it shows that something has really changed. I would argue that all of this constrains not only what can be done by the United States, but also what can be done by this reactionary uh, Congress of Vienna type Arab conservative coalition. Uh, 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 nothing is yet decided about the future nature of the Egyptian political system, the constitution. It's not clear what kind of constitution they're going to have. It's not clear what the future position of the president is going to be. It's not clear whether they're going to have a parliamentary or presidential system. It's not clear what the role of the army is going to be. It's not going to clear whether, what degree there's going to be civilian supervision over the military. None of this is clear. In this kind of situation, I'm arguing, neither the United States, nor Saudi Arabia, nor even Qatar, that superpower with 200,000 subjects. They're not citizens, they're subjects. Um, about as much as the Upper West Side. Highest GDP in the world, $88,000 per person. Uh, none of these countries can really control outcomes. I would argue that Israel's peace treaty with Egypt is going to survive these upheavals. So will the treaty with Jordan, even if there are full democratic transitions in the entire Arab world. Most Arabs have absolutely no desire for war with Israel. And all the Arab states put together are incapable of standing up to Israel for more than a day or two in a conventional war. In fact, they can't stand up to it, and they know it. In Egypt, moreover, there is no serious political force calling for abrogating the peace treaty. So it's simply not going to happen. Uh, there is, however, widespread desire for modifications of the treaty. The treaty imposed humiliating limitations on Egyptian sovereignty, which are going to be raised by whatever government comes up in Cairo. But having said this, let me say one other thing. There is a shared Arab popular demand for justice for the Palestinians and strong opposition in most Arab countries to normalization with Israel before such justice is achieved. The United States put a har cart before the horse, normalize with Israel, and in decades maybe the Palestinians will get justice. Well, most people in the Arab world think that was a bad idea. And so uh, I think that, that process is going, to, is going to be changed a little bit. Um, the Arab satellite TV stations ensure, however bad they are in many respects, they ensure that their viewers have reasonably good access to, to information about events inside Palestine, unlike us in the United States, whose media gives us nothing uh, about this subject, or almost nothing. Of course, the military and economic power of both the United States and Israel remained unrivaled in this region. They are, they're both they tower over the region in both respects. And the Arab countries are still as weak and divided as ever. In some ways, they're more divided. But Washington or Jerusalem can no longer rely indefinitely on the servility towards them of Arab regimes uh, that, are, that, that were weak and illegitimate in the past and that are maybe still weak but are increasing in legitimacy and have to pay attention to their peoples increasingly in the future. Although thoroughgoing regime change has not yet occurred in any Arab country, this servility towards especially the United States, which is a key feature of the old Arab order, is being challenged uh, all over the region. Uh, I, I, I was going to talk about the, uh, the role of the degree to which this shift has led to a uh, uh, modification in the servility of some American clients. I was going to talk about Mahmoud Abbas going to the United Nations. Uh, after patiently going along with the peace process, which in 20 years didn't deliver peace, but tripled the Israeli settler population and 
uh, cemented Israel's control over the occupied territories. It didn't provide peace, but it did provide wonderful careers for many American officials. And I have to read to you this little anecdote that I found in my research for my new book. Uh, James Baker once said to Aaron David Miller, who was one of the chief officials responsible for the management of this so-called peace process over 20-something years, Baker said to him, I want you to know, Aaron, you have to imagine this in a Texas accent. I want you to, I'm not going to imitate it. I want you to know, Aaron, if I had another life, I'd want to be a Middle East specialist just like you. And he had a big, long finger. He must have pointed it at him. Because it would mean guaranteed permanent employment. And that's what the peace process did. It didn't bring peace, but it brought really, really good job opportunities to people who worked on it. So what I'm suggesting is that uh, this shift has forced even leaders who were almost completely in the shadow of the United States to consider uh, 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 moving out of it. Um, I, won't, I won't give you the, 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 the chapter and verse on that. It seems to me clear that Arab rulers, even the ones who are still absolute rulers, are going to have a harder time entirely ignoring the wishes of their people, of their peoples, as they've done in the past. They've submissively followed Washington's lead, for example, in its Cold War with Iran. They've remained silent while the United States protected Israel from any pressure as it colonized Palestinian land and entrenched the occupation. Uh, these policies of Arab governments are much harder to defend in the face of an energized public. In those countries where democratic change has begun, the four or five, and in other countries where there are already elements of freedom of speech or freedom of the press or parliamentary rule, countries like Morocco, countries like Jordan, countries like Kuwait and Lebanon, um, the public is going to play an even larger role, I think. Almost everything important remains to be decided in the Arab world, and a genuine and sustained input of public opinion into the making of foreign policy via institu institutionalized democratic means is still in the future. We're not there yet by any means. But I would argue that it is more difficult today for Arab rulers to ignore their domestic public opinion and blindly follow Washington's lead. Since World War II, the United States has done more than any external power to shape the Middle East. It did this through its oil con concessions, through its military bases, through its economic might, through its support of Israel, and through its wars in the region and on the peripheries of the region. In more recent decades, it may have affected the Arab region, the United States, more than it affected any other region in the world in the last couple of decades, I would argue. But the rise of new powers globally and regionally, the rise of more democratic governments globally and regionally, and the rise of new regional configurations all over the globe, combined with the current crisis of the neoliberal world economic model, means we may, we may, I stress the may, be facing a new conjuncture. All of these things together means we may be facing a new conjuncture. If, big if, there are Arab governments that are more responsive to the wishes of their peoples, and those that have been around for generations could not have been less responsive. And if, another big if, this region can show even a modicum of regional collaboration as compared with the venomous inter-Arab politics of the past, if and if, then interesting changes, not just in the Arab order, but in the global order, maybe in the offing. Imagine if you actually had a regional common market such as Southeast Asian states, several Latin American states, the European, I mean, almost everybody else in the world has done this. Only this region has been exempt. Uh, not having a single, very extended, very large family control unlimited resources in several key oil producing countries would mean an interesting change in the world and in the world economy, not just among the Arabs. Think about that. Single families control the entire wealth of the Arab oil producing countries. A family, they own it. Think of Louis XIV, l'état c'est moi. Think of, I don't know, Henry VIII. That's the state in those countries, absolute rule. There's one exception, Kuwait. Not having an unlimited funding motor for the most retrograde, and in some cases terrorist, religious tendencies in Islam would constitute another interesting change. That would follow on a change in these single-family controlled, multi-billion dollar foreign policy for each prince states. There are princes in some of these countries who have budgets to spend abroad that are larger than medium-sized countries, okay? 
individual princes. We're not talking about the state, we're talking about individual princes. Decent relations among Arabs and Turks, or Arabs and Kurds, or even Arabs and Iranians would make for an interesting change. Obviously, none of these things is necessarily going to happen. None of these things is guaranteed. None of these, these things is even necessarily likely to happen. Many factors militate against them. I could give a whole lecture on why they might not happen. But if some of them do happen, that would have an enormous impact on relations between America and the Arabs. And it would mark one of the first times in a very long while that the Arabs have had significant agency in their relationship with Washington. It is the Arab revolts that have made it possible even to consider possibilities that were unimaginable 12 months ago. These revolts have changed the potentialities not only for the Arab world, but also for the position of the greatest power of our age, us, the United States, within this most strategically important world region. This is why I think all of us should consider that much more rides on the Arab revolts than just the fate of the Arabs. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rashid. I'm going to take a couple of questions. We have uh, 15 minutes or less. You want to come here or you want to shoot from there? Yeah. There are microphones over there if you want. You don't, you don't need the microphone. Do we need the microphone? If you can project, well, project. Okay, fine. Yeah. I, think, um, you, you have, I think you have produced, uh, Mr. Khalid, I think you might have reduced the, uh, the Islamic movements a little bit to, to, to a black box. lumping together Salafists and, and the Muslim Brotherhood um, in, in Egypt and, and, and also describing them as purely a, a counter-revolutionary force. I, I think you don't think that that, that might be um, slightly over-simplistic. Um, I, I think that they're, they're, they're more complex than that, really, the, um, the Muslim Brotherhood. And I wonder whether you could comment on that and also whether you see a kind of shift um, in relation to, from the international community in relation to political yeah. um, Islam. Right. And I was wondering, my second question, um, whether in relation to the U.S. relations to, to Egypt, um, does anything speak louder than the $1.3 billion than the U.S. gives to, to, um, to Egypt? I mean, do you think they could have considered withdrawing that, uh, that money? A short answer to the second question is no. No. <laughs> it's vital. That's a vital strategic interest. No. It's inconceivable. Um, no, I, if, if, if you understood me, uh, I, 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 I did not mean in any way to, uh, to uh, conflate the Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafis. They're completely different. And I, when I talked about reaction, I was talking about the Gulf countries. So the counter-revolution is led by Saudi Arabia and its allies in the Gulf. Uh, the parties that they have formed are the Salafis. The Salafi party in Egypt didn't exist. It was entirely foreign-funded. Now, the Salafis were there, uh, but they were not a party. They were completely opposed to involvement in politics. They were opposed to elections. They were, oppo they were opposed to democracy. And suddenly, they formed a political party that became the second largest party in the Egyptian parliament. Uh, this is a result, first, of the, f of the fact that people obviously underestimated them, but secondly, of their massive funding from abroad. Um, and they're uh, as different as night is from day, I would argue from the Brotherhood. The Brotherhood is a well-established Egyptian political party going back to the 1920s. It's won elections. I mean, it's won seats in the light, not hasn't won an election, a majority, but it has managed to successfully compete in Egyptian elections for generations. I mean, going back to the, going back to the pre-1952 period. So it's an indigenous Egyptian political force, and most of its money is, comes from Egypt, actually, or Egyptians abroad. It, it may have gotten foreign support, but the Brotherhood is an indigenous, as is another, an indigenous movement in, the, in those countries. I didn't mean in any way to conflate the two or to suggest that they are identical. They're not. But let me say this. What I said about the Brotherhood and another insofar as their economics is true. And if you, if you ask why has Washington changed its attitude towards the Brotherhood, well, several things. First of all, they are pragmatists in Washington. I mean, you may want Mubarak back, but you're not going to get him. So what's the next best? You deal with the reality, and the reality is that these are the parties. 
the first thing that they're going to do is not cut their ties to the military. That's why they will not cut off their funding. She would have gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with senators and congressmen and congresswomen, if necessary, to preserve that $1.3 billion. I, I said it's the mo uh, when I mentioned the three core interests, I said it's the first. It's by far the most important, the Army. They will not give that up if they can avoid it, obviously. Um, and that plus the Brotherhood means a configuration in, in Egypt which they can live with. If the army keeps its position, if the treaty is not abrogated, and Egypt stays, you know, within this economic model, they don't care in Washington, you know, whether the Speaker of Parliament has a beard or not. What do they care? Uh, the Senefis are a different kettle of fish. Do you want to uh, step to the, to the microphone? Because they can't hear, the, they can't record the questions if you don't, if you ask them from the audience. Do you mind coming here? Yes, yes. People who want to ask questions, line up over here, please, so that we can speed this up. Thank you. Thank you very much for the talk. Uh, my name is Linda Herrera from the University of Illinois. I want to press you a little bit on the social media, new media landscape. I think it gets misunderstood and sometimes a little bit re reductive. Um, you did mention that you think that there is something new happening, there is some network non-hierarchical thing happening right. with the new media, but that it's completely useless for presidential campaigning or election, no, I didn't say election campaigning. Let me just uh, finish. And I would like to remind you of the role of social media and new media for the Obama campaign. The Obama campaign was a model for a number of the Egyptian youth movements, the Mohammed al-Barajai campaign, We Are Khaled Said campaign, members of the 6th of April youth movement learned and studied it. So there is this incredible force, a uh, new generation kind of using new media in this networked way with this potential to change things in a way that may not be understood. It's a whole group that can be tapped. Mm -hmm. um, election, I mean, presidential can, um, candidates and others. So if you can maybe comment on sure, that. Sure, and I'm happy to talk Thank about you. that. Um, anybody can use the new media. The Assad regime is using the new media. The Muslim Brotherhood used the new media. Um, that plus no organization gets you a, no seats in parliament. You have to have organization and money. And if you also have new media, I, I lived in Chicago for 16 years. You do not win elections with new media. You may get a lot more votes and, and, and reach people you would never otherwise have reached. You need organization and money. That's what the political victory of the president in the 2008 election was based on. That plus new media made him a much more formidable candidate. So I'm not denying the importance of new media. It's fabulously important. Uh, the point is that by and of itself is not enough to win an election. To win an election, you need people who can get out the vote in a huge country like Egypt, 80 plus million people, most of whom don't have computers. Uh, so what it required was nationwide organization. One of the parties that shocked everybody by becoming the third largest party in parliament was the Waft Party, which has been around since 1919. And they had countrywide organization. Now, I don't know what new media they used. They have a newspaper and they have a TV station. And they probably did new, use new media, I don't know. I wasn't following that. Everybody was shocked by their victory. That was organization and money. And, and that, that's what really wins elections. And what I was trying to say was that the reason that many of these revolutions eluded the ubiquitous surveillance of the secret police is because they did not have hierarchical structured organizations. They were uh, networked and they were amorphous. And that, and, and, and that new media was essential in. That was important. So new media was important to the success of the revolution. The problem is, without, without a certain kind of party organization, you can't win an election just with that. And, 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 and many people in Egypt were terribly disappointed in the two rounds of the elections that I was there for at the fact that people who had been very, very important in the revolution were unable to put together a successful election campaign, whereas people who were not involved in the revolution, like the Senefis, who were against. Uh, uh, became the, 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 the second largest party. And that was clearly money and organization. I don't know what new media they used myself, the set in Egypt. Okay. Uh, Rashid, you, you make a, an incredibly compelling and depressing case that uh, forces for reaction are still dominant, and I think you're right. Uh, what, if anything, uh, could shift the dynamic in favor of 
anything that's on the side of, of, of these uh, movements towards dignity. And I mean, on the, yeah. on the counter-revolutionary side, we have American foreign policy, we have American money, we have Gulf money, uh, we have all the traditional vectors of power, which I agree with you are still dominant even in the, even in the age of Twitter. Uh, so, so what, if anything, could shift money or weapons or things that really change power in, in a good direction? One, one thing I didn't have enough of a chance to talk about is that we shouldn't assume that the United States and its Gulf allies are always on the same page. In fact, quite frequently, they're not. Um, the United States didn't care about Mubarak going when they realized he was going to go. The Saudis are still angry about that. They are still furious about that. They have never, never forgotten that an autocrat was allowed to go down in that way um, by the United States. So there are big the United States is much more pragmatic about these things and much less ideological. The United States is not against democracy. If democracy interferes with important American interests, they're against democracy. So Hamas, democratically elected, they're against Hamas. It has nothing to do with democracy. But if, if the Muslim Brotherhood doesn't threaten those core interests and is elected democratically, and which it has been in parliament, that's fine. So there's a big difference between uh, Saudi Arabia, which is fundamentally against any form of popular representation under any circumstances anywhere, ever, okay? <laughs> we are talking, you know, we're talking Metternich. We're talking, uh, uh, what can I say, unreconstructed reactionaries. The United States is not against democracy. It's for its interests. So, so there's, a, there's a big difference there. And I tried to argue that the, and it obviously didn't succeed to, to, to convince people or didn't make it clear enough, that in many of these countries, the unsettled nature of the situation makes it all the harder for both the United States and Saudi Arabia and others, external actors, to have an impact. I mean, how you, how you affect the sausage making process that is producing the Egyptian constitution, only God knows. I don't really think the Saudis are gonna be very successful myself in many important respects in Egypt. It's very hard to control outcomes in a country where the people are unleashed in the way that they've been unleashed in some of these countries. They're having trouble with Yemen. Yemen is in their backyard. The, the, the Hezb al-Islah are, 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 are people that they can deal with. The military they can deal with. They can't deal with the popular revolution sitting in the streets of Sana'a. There's, they have a problem with that. And, and so there are all kinds of forces that militate against the necessary success either of the United States in its achieving its objectives or of Saudi Arabia. American objectives are much more modest than those of Saudi Arabia. They don't really care about a lot of things, which the Saudis do care about. They have religious objectives and they have political objectives insofar as a, f a kind of orthodoxy that they want to impose religiously and insofar as a kind of reactionary politics that they want to see prevail. The United States doesn't care about either of those things at all, one way or another. So we have uh, five minutes for the last question and answer. Rhonda. Hello, hi. Question. Um, as the question that was previous to this one asked about the military stipend to Egypt. About? The military stipend to Egypt from the yeah, US government. The question from over um, here. I guess the question that I have situating it more regionally, if we were to see the removal of the Assad regime in Syria, mm -hmm. can we expect some sort of change in the strategic relationship between the US and the Middle Eastern countries? And I guess more broadly, if he was removed and replaced with a leader more amenable to U.S. interests, I guess less caustic in nature, would that be a benefit to U.S. relations with Israel or yeah, to its Yeah, that's states a good there? question. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know the answer. It's a very good question. Um, the American interest in Syria is not as clear-cut as it seems. On the one hand, the United States would dearly love to see Iran weakened. There is an American obsession which is borders on the irrational with Iran. And therefore, anything that weakens Iran is a good thing. And the Assad regime has been the primary ally of Iran in the world for a long, except, except for Russia, obviously, or certainly in the region for a long, long time. So there is the plus side. The, the, the negative side is both Israel and the United States are, have been perfectly comfortable with the Assad regime as a neighbor of Israel. This is the safest frontier Israel has. It's not, it's, not a, it's, not a, it's not a negotiated border, it's a ceasefire line, but it's completely quiet. And it is a regime that the, for all of the reasons that both Israel and the United States don't like it, it's completely reliable in certain respects. And they've made agreements with the Syrian regime, the red line agreement back in the days of Rabin with Hafez and Assad, talking about the 1970s, scrupulously respected by both sides. So for a variety of reasons, the United States is not entirely in favor of 
massive destabilizing regime change in Syria because they don't know what will come next. And that's the, that's the point that all of these, everybody who talks about the United States is doing this because it wants this. Well, the United States, firstly, what it wants is often not what people think it is. And secondly, how they get what they want is the, is the, is the, is the, is the crucial issue. How do, you, how do you guarantee a regime arrives in power in Damascus that will do the things that you want? There's almost no way to guarantee that. And so I, I think the United States is very hesitant about what to do about Syria. The fact the United States is standing there doing nothing is not a coincidence, in other words. It's because they really are not as sure. Now, Saudi Arabia and some of the Gulf countries have clearly decided they want to bring this regime down. And I could describe why and how they have come to that decision. It has to do with historic factors that go way back to the beginning of Wahhabism and what Al Saud thinks is their role in the Eastern Arab world and so on and so forth. But it also has to do with really nasty calculations about sectarian issues. It has a lot to do with Iran. The Saudis have their own calculus vis-a-vis -vis Iran, which is different to the American one. It has to do with a variety of other factors. So they're not on the same page at all on this. And then there's finally Turkey, which has yet other interests. And the United States has to pay attention not just to what Israel wants, and not just to what Saudi Arabia wants, but also to what Turkey wants. So it's a very complex equation. And as I've already said, this is not Libya. OK, Mali is an important country. Tunisia is an important country. But Turkey, Iraq. The countries, Israel, these are some of the most important countries in the world in terms of oil production, in terms of where they sit strategically, in terms of the, the interpenetration of ethnicities like the Kurds across borders, and so on and so forth. So Syria is a very delicate issue for the United States. And I, I think that they're in uncharted waters. And they're, I think they're worried. And they're right to be worried. I think everybody's right to be worried. Whatever your position on, on Syria is, you're right to be worried. Because whatever comes next is, is unknown. If something, if, if, if one, as one, many of us hope, the regime is finally removed. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. We have five to ten minutes for the next panel. Thanks again, Rashid Khali. Thank you.